I mean, depression is a debilitating illness, typically lifelong. Sometimes people will just get one episode, but uh, in many people, it comes and goes for the rest of their life. Um, and it becomes more difficult to treat with every episode. And of course, we all have moods that go up and down, and that's not necessarily unhealthy. Uh, however, there is a clinical syndrome called major depressive disorder, where people have certain symptoms for a, a certain period of time. Uh, and the hallmark symptoms are usually a depressed mood, which is different in character from everyday uh, mood. So it's not like being down dumps um, normally. Um, the second hallmark is a loss of enjoyment or reward from everyday activities. The third um, feature which is usually present, uh, has to be usually present for uh, depression is fatigue and lack of energy. Uh, and those are the three core, and usually one or two of those have to be uh, present. I think the view of the general public is that depression is people just feeling a bit melancholic, a bit sad, a bit fed up. But what isn't appreciated is that it's actually a major cause of premature death. You know, the suicide rate is enormous. About 20% of people with depression attempt suicide and about 12 to 15% of them succeed. What's particularly worrying is that that rate is increasing in young people. The very first antidepressant was actually being used to treat tuberculosis. And a side effect of that drug was to induce euphoria. But then someone had the bright idea of saying, well, if um, this drug makes ordinary um, you know, people who are otherwise well euphoric, maybe it will cheer up depressed people if we give it to them. And it worked. And that led to, you know, the, the whole portfolio of drugs that we have as antidepressants today. Well, there's no doubt that antidepressants are useful. There's no doubt that talking therapies are useful. But um, they are not the ideal treatment. The first thing to be remembered or to be emphasized is that um, depression is extremely common. It's one of the leading causes of burden of disease, so-called by the WHO. Because depression is common, and um, at any one time, perhaps five to 10% of people may be suffering from depression, it's twice as common in women. But because people can have depression off and on for decades, that means the burden of disease, the, uh, the, the morbidity, uh, and indeed, the early mortality and reduced life expectancy are extremely important. So we need, we crucially do need better treatments to try and improve the outcome uh, of people with depression. Only about 30% of depressed people actually respond to the first antidepressant they're given. About 30% more patients respond to some treatment eventually. About 30% of depressed patients don't respond to any drug treatment at all. Um, and they are often the patients who go for electric convulsive therapy because everything else has failed. The, the other reason we need new ones is because most antidepressants take weeks or months before they start to work. They're not like antibiotics where if the patient isn't feeling better in a couple of days, try another antibiotic. They do have side effects which um, cannot be ignored um, and those side effects can be really quite dangerous in overdose. Um, and of course depressed patients are just the sort of people who are likely to attempt suicide and you don't want to give them drugs that are actually dangerous in overdose. We'd ideally want a treatment that would um, remove depression very quickly um, without, with minimal side effects and it wouldn't come back. Depression is often thought of as a uniquely human experience. Um, but depression is a very complex disease with lots of different symptoms. So some of those symptoms, like the loss of interest or pleasure, 
we can look at in mice. So we can look at how mice change their interest in food or water. But more complicated symptoms around suicidal thoughts, uh, feelings of worthlessness and guilt, you can't ask a mouse how it's feeling. So those are the sort of elements that we can't, we can't really address in animal models. Um, but we use uh, behaviours that put the mice in mildly stressful situations. So one of the ones that we typically use is something called the forced swim test. So when we do the forced swim test with mice, um, they're gently placed in a cylinder of warm water for six minutes and they spend time swimming and climbing, which we think of as escape related behaviours. And they also spend time immobile. And then at the end of the six minutes, they're taken out of the test, they're warmed, they're dried, and they're returned to their home cage, where they show a full range of home cage behaviours, which indicates that the um, animals are not experiencing any long lasting harm as a result of the forced swim test. Both rats and mice are naturally buoyant, so they don't sink. They float on the surface of the water and they float with their noses above the water and their bodies hanging down and they, they just carry out the occasional movement of their legs and their feet. So they, they give up swimming and climbing. What is clear is that all antidepressant drugs delay the onset of that floating posture. So animals do tend to swim around um, and explore the perimeter um, of the tank for much longer, appreciably longer, you know, two or three times longer, when they've been given an antidepressant drug before the test. It was first introduced as a, for screen and antidepressants, so as a quick screen for antidepressant activity. And I think that that's an important point to make about it. It's, it's a bit overstated if um, we want to say that it's a model of depression. And that's a very important point to make, is that do we have, in laboratory animals, do we have models of depression or do we have screening tests for antidepressants? Or do we have models that might purport to be both? And in my opinion, the force swim test has been a screening test for antidepressant activity. Many of the symptoms of depression, you cannot recapitulate in animals basically um, but what we can try to do in animals is actually try to mimic some of the aspects of of depression we can look in on um, other aspects that are associated with depression like disorganized sleep that we can definitely do with the animals so you need to diversify your your tests and not just rely on one readout one test is not going to do it it's the same for humans one test is not going to tell you if the human if a human is depressed or not so you need you definitely need to diversify well i can absolutely say with 100 percent confidence that no animal has ever drowned in the four swim test not only would they not drown because they float naturally they also wouldn't drown because if they showed any signs of drowning they would have to be pulled out of the tank immediately. So when we're developing new uh, medicines, we start off by testing them in cultured cells and isolated tissues so that we can learn as much about the effects of the medicine before we get to doing any testing in an animal. But fundamentally, if you want to know how a new potential medicine is going to work in a human, you have to start by looking at a whole behaving organism. So we're also required by the Home Office to use the animal species with the lowest capacity to experience pain, suffering and distress. And yet they have to still be capable of having the same brain structures that we have in our mammalian brains. So for us, that leads us to mice and to rats. Other models for looking at antidepressant activity and the effectiveness of antidepressants in animals are being developed.
but at the moment there are none that are as well validated across a wide range of antidepressant medicines as the forced swim test. The antidepressant medicines that are available are effective for those for whom they work, but they are limited. So less than half of the people who take an antidepressant will get completely well after that. So there is still a need for new and better antidepressants. And at the moment, there is no alternative to using animals in that research.